Psalm 32 in verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. What a promise that the Lord is saying. You know, in a couple of scriptures right before that, he says, that, uh, and the psalmist prayed, you are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. We get to be in, in position where the Lord literally hides us, cocoons us in his love. You are my hiding place. That scripture is, is, the, uh, is the beginning of verse 7. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. That's the verse. That's verse 7. That's a whole, the, the whole verse. Verse 7. You are my hiding place. I remember when I was, you know, young in the Lord and I, and I read that scripture. I love that. It's, you know, certain scriptures just jump out at you in certain seasons of your life, right? Well, that scripture really just jumped out. And I remember sitting where you're all sitting. Um, I remember sitting in the congregation, like as worship was going on, and uh, and this song, it was a song. You are my, you guys know the song, right? Old song. You are my hiding place. You always fill me up with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. So we're singing this song, and I'm over there, in the, and I'm sitting there, standing there with the congregation, and um, the, re the revelation of that scripture, you are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. You are my hiding place. I was new in the Lord, and I remember just literally feeling the Lord just absorb me, right, with his just like this circular, um, he, you know, like cocooning. And I remember just like, wow, right? And I thought, you are my hiding place. Like this scripture is real. They're all, it's all true. It's all real. But when it becomes revelation to you, right? At that moment, I knew that I knew that no matter what, God, my defender, God, my healer, my savior, the one that speaks on my behalf, right? He's my voice when I have none, he, right? He, the one that protects and preserves me, was going to protect me and hide me in him. You are my hiding place. And we know in Psalms, you know, 90, 91, which we're not going to go there right now, but many scriptures throughout the word talk about his wraparound love. He shields us. He shields us. You know that word shield, when you look it up, it talks about a wraparound love, right? I didn't know that at the time. I was very new in the Lord, but yet I felt his shield going all around me, kind of absorbing me. And I knew I was in his bubble. We are, we get to be in his hiding place. He gets to hide us, you know, under the, under the shelter of his wings, right? Praise the Lord. And depending on where you're at in your walk, that might be really important to you, right? Like, so where I was at that time, that was really important to me. It's always important, but it was a big deal back then. You know, and so obviously God does different things in our lives and he grows us and he, he moves us forward and hey, he's still my hiding place. I still run to him. But obviously that scripture was because he was dealing with the brokenness in my heart at the time, right? And that's what he does. He deals with what he needs to at the time. And so the word of God is powerful. So let's go back to eight. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. He is our instructor. He's our teacher. The Holy Spirit will teach you. He will teach you in the way, the way that you should go. So there is a way. We know that he is the way. He is the truth and he is the life, right? Jesus said, he is, he's, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? No man comes to the Father except for through me, right? So Jesus is the way. So he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way. There's not many ways. There's the way. Like for you to walk in the perfect will of God, there are not many ways. There's a way. It, there's the way. And so he says, I will teach you. I will instruct you as you walk in the way that he has already laid out for you. The problem is sometimes people resist that way and they want to go their way, right? And, and, and that's when the inner turmoil starts and that's where, that's where thievery comes into, into play. Right? We, we don't want to walk in our way. We want to walk in his way. So it says, I will instruct you. Aren't you glad his word says he will instruct you? He says, I will instruct you and I will teach you in the way you should go. 
Now, if you give instructions to someone, you give them the facts. Go down the street, make a left at the light, you know, go, go, you know, make a U-turn, whatever. You're giving them instructions, right? But when you teach somebody, you go a little deeper than that, right? You literally lay it out. You literally give them the details. You teach to teach. When we teach, we teach by giving examples. We teach by, by our lives, our lifestyle should be teaching, right? But so, and isn't his? Jesus is the one that teaches us. He instructs us and he teaches us. Have you ever thought about those two words? Or you're like, oh, it's like the same thing. Why would it be duplicated? It's not the same thing. It's similar, but it's not the same thing. Because you can instruct somebody, but when you teach them and you really genuinely teach the details, uh, you, you teach, you correct, you, you give them examples, you live your lives so that your lives are also speaking, which is what Jesus does. He's our model, right? We get to, when we read the word, we see how did Jesus respond? What does his word say? Well, we learn from that. Not only does he instructs us, instruct us, but he teaches us the way to go. I love this scripture because it's a powerful promise. It says, I will. No matter what's going on, I will. I will teach you. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And then he says, I will guide you with my eye. He's guiding you with his sight. He is guiding you with his vision. You know, there are a lot of people that are moving around, walking about with no sight, no vision, no true direction. And maybe at one point that was you. That was all of us at one point because I know it was me. It was all of us at one point. But until we understand that God is leading us and he is guiding us with his own sight, his eyes, right? When we see and understand that, we go, wow, Lord, I don't want to be off. I don't even want to be just a tiny, tiny bit off. You know, when you think about a compass, if that compass is slightly off, you're going to be completely off. Right? And so he is our compass, right? We, you know, Christ, the Lord Almighty, right? So we measure everything by his word. We make sure that we are in divine alignment and we're not just a little bit off, a little bit off in his word. Oh, we don't read, we don't pray every day because, you know, we got busy. No, we need to make sure that we keep our lives so saturated in his word and it becomes such something that you do by memory. It's just rote. It's just something that you do. It's your lifestyle. It's your lifestyle. You don't forget about eating and you don't forget about sleeping, right? And so we don't forget about eating the manna that comes forth from his word to our spirit every single day, right? And so why? Because we want to stay connected. We want to stay true north. We don't want to be off just a little bit. We get off a little bit and we continue to get off and off and off. Eventually, you know what? He says, I'm instructing you and I'm teaching you in the way you should go. But if you refuse to go, you're not going to go. He says, in the way you should go. He doesn't make us robots. He doesn't force us to follow after his will. He doesn't force us to follow after his will. So I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Let's keep going. Let's keep going on here. It says, do not be like the horse or like the mule. How many of you guys know some of those people? We're talking about people right now. You may be speaking of a horse and a mule, but that's just an example. Do not be like the horse or, or, or like the mule who have no understanding which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Hard, huh? Have you ever had that? Where you're called to minister to somebody that's like the horse and the mule? So, so stubborn? They got to be harnessed. And even with the harness, they just break through the harness. Mm-mm, not good and not God. Don't let that be you, though. Right? No, we want to be soft, pliable, teachable. Why? Because we're hidden in the presence of the Lord. He literally hides us and he cocoons us. He literally will speak to your heart. He will teach you. He will walk, he will walk with you. He will show you the way to go. He says, I will instruct you and I will teach you. I will counsel you with my eyes. He says, I will watch over your ways. You're going, both coming and going, both now and forevermore. Promise after promise after promise. We read. So it says, do not be like... In verse 9, do not be like. If he says do not be like, it's, it's easy for us to understand that there are some that are like. And it doesn't please God. Do not be like the horse or like the mule. who have, They have no understanding. They must be harnessed with a bit and bridle. Else they will not come near you. Then it says many sorrows shall be 
to the wicked. But to he who trusts the Lord, mercy shall surround him. You know, one of the most important things you can do with your lives, the most important thing, is to live your lives so in obedience to the Lord that as you see various things happening all around you, you hear various things happening in the Christian realm, it doesn't, it doesn't move you. It doesn't, it's not going to move you. It's not going to get you off course. God is watching. He watches. He sees. He sees us. He sees you. I know that I want my life to be so pure before him. So when you mess up, guess what? Quickly repent. Just quickly repent. Just, you know, don't, don't make it, don't have it be like, you know, hours or days or weeks. Like, quickly repent. What a beautiful word repentance is. When you don't quickly repent, this is what, they're, this is what we're talking about, the horse and the mule, that they, they become stubborn. That spirit of stubbornness is idolatry, right? And Samuel talks about the spirit of idolatry, which is really stubbornness, right? Stubbornness is idolatry, and we know idolatry. How, how bad is that, right? It's horrible. But we want to be people that are walking alongside with the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, which we're going to get to the scripture in a moment, but he walks alongside us. He teaches us. He guides us. He counsels us. It's the most beautiful thing when we remember this is such a privilege. You're not walking alone. You're not walking by yourself. It's not just you. It's not just you and your family. It's not just you and people you know in your circles. The spirit of the living God, but have you paid attention? Have you called on his name today? Like, have you called on his name today? Because, and I know we were all here, we're all worshiping, so we have all called on his name today, but on on a regular basis, on a daily basis. On a daily basis, guys, because he walks with us, and he waits for us to acknowledge him. So when you trust in the Lord, it says mercy shall surround you, and we get to trust in the almighty God. Mercy Mercy shall surround me. Mercy is surrounding you right now. Uh, Jump over to Psalm 33 and verse um, 18. It says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. There are so many scriptures throughout the word that talk about the eye of the Lord or the eyes of the Lord. You know, sometimes it says the eye of the Lord. But, you know, the eyes of God, okay? It's just the way that it was written. It says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. When you fear the Lord and you want your life to represent him well, when you do this, it says here, behold, the eyes of the Lord, I'm going to say eyes, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. What a promise. He says, I'm going to keep you alive in famine. It may be famine for everybody else, but I'm going to keep you alive in it. I'm going to provide what you need throughout the famine. He says, I'm going to deliver your soul from death. Why? Because there's an accuser of the brethren that's trying to kill, steal, and destroy. But he says, I'm going to deliver you from death. I'm going to deliver you. And you know, people watch. People watch our lives. Our family members, they watch our lives, right? Our children, our grandchildren, uh, extended family, they watch our lives, right? And so it is our decision, and it has to be, it has to be our decision to where we think, you know what, I'm going to make sure my life is living in a way that pleases the Lord so, so much that they can't find fault. Well, they may try, and they may come up with some things, but they're going to have to go farther back. They're going to have to go pretty far back, right, to come up with things. And those things are under the blood anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But to live our lives in such a way that we know the eyes of the Lord are upon me. I get to please him. I want to please him because I love him and I'm grateful for what Jesus has already done. But also because there's so much hypocrisy in the church that I want those that are so close to me to see, wow, they really are. She really is. He really is the real deal. Wow, they really do serve God. They really do love God. They really believe what they say they believe. They really do. They're not, they're not out there being weird just for weird sake. They're literally genuinely trusting in the Lord. Can we live our lives so that our own children see and go, wow, there's some stability there. There's truth there. You know, there's a time period where they just reject it because they just, you know, I'm just going to be, you know, as free as I can be. But um, 
um, there, there's just, there's so many things that are such a discrediting towards Christians, right? And dishonoring towards, towards the Lord. Bottom line, it's towards the Lord. When you sin, you sin against God, first and foremost. When you sin against an individual or yourself, you're sinning against God. And so with all that that goes on, and nothing new under the sun, we know that, but with so much that's going on so prevalent right now, so strong in the, in the news, and, you know, it, um, with, with Christians and God, supposedly God-fearing Christians that have so fallen far, but they've fallen short. They have fallen away, right? We have to be people that say, you know what? That's an example of what not to do. We get to keep our eyes on Jesus. There, there are plenty of examples of what not to do, right? But can you and will you allow the truth of God's word, which I've already read to you a couple of verses about how his eyes are on you. There's so many more verses about that. But can you, will you live your lives so that even if they tried to come and say something against you, your character and who you are, it would not carry any weight. There's no proof. There's nothing that they could find. There's nothing. It's a matter of fact because you know God is the one that protects your reputation. He's the one that upholds you. He literally will surround you with truth. When they try to speak some things that are not of God against you, but there doesn't carry any weight because you built your house upon the rock, not on the sand. You built your house upon the rock, which is a solid ground. It doesn't crumble. You don't crumble. Words may fall to the ground and crumble, but you don't crumble. Why? Because we know the eyes of the Lord are upon us. And we're going to walk in a way that is so honoring unto him and it is a choice church it is a daily choice it is easy to walk in the flesh it is easy to just get get annoyed and, and walk in the flesh and start to be you know critical and and just unforgiving it's easy to walk in the flesh we are not called to walk in the flesh we're called to walk in the spirit we're called to lay down that old lifestyle and say you know what that person's dead why am i resurrecting the dead when that's supposed to stay dead that old person, right? We're, we're going to live in a way that gives God so much glory and so much honor. There's joy in this church. When you do this, there's so much joy. There's, this is not a heartache. This is not a difficult thing. This is, there's joy to live your lives in a way that you know God is watching. He sees. I think some people have forgotten that. I think some people have forgotten that the eyes of the Lord are upon whom? The righteous. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Some people, I think, have forgotten this. My goodness. And the fear of the Lord has just gone out the window. Have the fear of the Lord. We must have the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One, which is understanding. He gives us that wisdom. He gives us that understanding as we choose the fear of the Lord. Amen. Fear of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's go back to verse uh, Psalm 33. Um, I read to you 18 and 19. I'm going to keep reading in verse 20. We love your word, Father. Your word is like a life to us. It's water. It's food. Verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Our souls wait for the Lord. Is your soul being satisfied in him? Remember, your body, soul, and spirit. And so your soul, your spirit is what was born again. When you said yes to the Lord, it was your spirit, man, that was born again. Amen. Your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions is a good thing. God has given them to you. We just don't, we're not led by them. But your soul is waiting for the Lord. What do you mean it's waiting for the Lord? It's being sanctified. You're being sanctified. You're being sanctified. Set apart yeah. unto his his will, his goodness, right? So our, I just read, your soul is waiting, right? The goal is, is that our souls magnify the Lord, right? So the more that as you wait, what that means by waiting, it means a longing, inner uh, dependency, and a longing within us that is so yearning, oh God, I have to have more of you. That is the hunger that God puts in us as we stay faithful in his word and in his presence, this yearning, this stirring within our soul. 
starts to increase. This yearning, this stirring within our soul, it goes, starts to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's what I'm talking about. You then become so, uh, so alive and so filled with this Holy Spirit. It's like his holy goodness, his Holy Spirit is upon you and it's within you and you are oozing out the goodness of the Lord. You are one that you know and others know as well. My God, the eyes of the Lord are upon them. They fear the Lord. They're literally just swimming in this pool of God's goodness. There's nothing that's going to get them down. Exactly. Because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Because of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh. I, even as I look out, I see some of your faces, and I know some of your stories, right? And, uh, and, and I know, I see this face like, what about me? I don't, I'm trying. So here's the thing. It's good that you're trying. <laughs> What's even better is that you realize this. God has not abandoned you. God is not leaving you. There are seasons that we walk in that are so hard. There are seasons we walk in that if it wasn't for the grace of God, my goodness, you would have never made it. You just would have never made it. You would not have come out of that. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you get to take no credit. If it wasn't for the grace of God, my goodness, you wouldn't have come out of that. And you know it. Right? So, you know, as I look out and I see some of your faces, I'm like, you know what? You guys hang on. You have hope in the Lord. God is your strength. I know I've been there many times. So I understand. Many of us have been there many times. We get it. We understand. It's not easy. It's hard sometimes, but the more that you see the faithfulness of God, the more that that next trial or that next difficulty, right, it loses its power. It starts to lessen, right? It starts to lessen. In other words, it's not that it doesn't have power. It just doesn't have the power over you that it used to have, right? So that po the power that it used to have over you starts to become less and less and less. And so though the trials don't stop, your ability to arise and go over those trials increases, right? Because you've seen the hand of God at work. You know, you made a decision a long time ago. I will keep my eyes on the Lord no matter what, no matter what persecution, no matter what ridicule, no matter what comes on, what comes against me, I will keep my eyes upon the Lord. I will hide, allow myself and be hidden myself and be hidden in the sanctuary of the Lord, which just means his presence, right? I will hide myself. Lord, I thank you that you are my hiding place. Where do you run to? Where do you go? Where do you hide? The Lord is your hiding place. So you run to him. You run to his word. You run to his presence. You make sure that you do. Not one day goes by without you opening up your word and say, Lord, I need to hear. And sometimes, to be honest with you, you'll read your word. You'll read it and you'll read it. And nothing is ministering to you. There are times you read and read and read. And it's like nothing, nothing. Keep on reading. Keep on reading. Don't stop. Don't stop because this is a tactic of the enemy to try to make you feel, oh, it doesn't work. It does work, but you got to be faithful and keep on keeping on. Keep on reading. Keep staying in the presence of God. You know, this is just truth. This is just, this is just reality. This is Christianity, right? It's not hype. It, it, I'm not trying to tell you something that is not, that is not uh, walked out, hasn't been walked out, but also that is not true. But there comes a point where, boy, you've seen his hand so many times. And, that, and that's why I talk about the fire of God so much and living on fire. Amen. We don't get to take credit for that. We know that it's all him, but there had to have been a yes in your spirit, even if it was just a whisper at some point. Even if it was just a whisper. Because you know what? He'll take that whisper. He'll take that little cry. He'll take that sound that just barely, no one else heard it, but Jesus, you didn't even hear it, but Jesus heard it. It was because he, he already knows the, he already knows your thoughts. He already knows your heart, right? So even before a word is spoken, he already knows it, right? So he hears that cry. He hears that cry and he responds. Why? Because he's a good God. He's a God that is with you. He's a God that, he's a God that walks alongside you. He has promised this to us. 2 Timothy uh, verse or chapter 1 and verse 12. This is for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He keeps what we commit. 
He keeps what we commit. Let, let's jump back a little bit. Let's just go, let's go back to verse 8 so we can kind of put this in context a little bit more. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in, in the sufferings for the gospel, for the gospel, not for stupidity. If you're suffering because you just were in sin, because you were just, you're making bad choices, that's not what this is talking about. But to suffer for the gospel's sake, yes, there is that, and that's beautiful. So, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. You're called with a holy calling, church. You're called not to just do your own will. You're called to do the will of God with a holy calling. A holy calling is one that resembles the Lord your God, your maker, who has appointed you to walk in a high calling, the high calling of God, the holy calling. Say, I have a holy calling. Not according to our works. You can't make it happen. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you already had a purpose. Thank you, Lord, that before you even formed us, you already knew us. You, Lord, you, you already knew us before we were fashioned and formed in my, our mother's womb. You had a purpose for us yeah. before we were even born. So according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began. This is already established. What he had for you already was established before time began but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. There is no death that's going to be able to keep you down. No death, no talk of death, no, no, no type of death. You know what I mean by when I say that, right? I mean, our bodies, we're all going to die one day. We know that. But our spirit's going to live on forever. But I'm talking about thievery and robbery. There's nothing. The Lord is faithful. He's faithful. But now it says, but now, oh, sorry, but has now been revealed, verse 10, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. We know his life literally abol abolished death, which we're talking about eternal death. We're talking about, we're talking about like dead in hell, like forever dead. You're, you're, that's not you. You've already said yes to Christ. You're going to live forever. Your spirit will live forever, though your body would die, right? So he's abolished death. And he brought life. How did he bring life? Through the Son, Jesus Christ. He brought life. Yes, Lord God, thank you. you. You brought life. And immortality to light throughout, it says, to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And then the verse that we just read, verse 12, for this reason. For what reason? What I just read. For the gospel's sake. For this reason, I also suffer these things. He's saying, yeah. If I suffer for the gospel's sake, praise God for it. For this reason, if you suffer because you're being persecuted, because you're not going to back down based on what the word of the Lord says, praise God for that. You're in good company. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, here's where, here's where the power of God steps in. He says, nevertheless, for I know. He says, I know. He says, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. For I know deep down inside, within the very core of who I am, within the very fibers of my being, I know whom I have believed. Wait, you haven't seen any of those promises come to pass yet? It doesn't matter. I know whom I have believed, and I am not ashamed of this gospel. I know whom I have believed. I have believed in the one and only. I have believed in the Lord God Almighty. I have believed in the one that saw me, knew me, called me by name, and pulled me out of that miry pit, that miry clay, and and says, I've already fashioned and formed you. I already knew you before you were born. And I already have a purpose for you. And that purpose is my purposes, which I'm causing to come to pass as you remember the fear of the Lord and keeping your eyes upon me, for my eyes are upon you. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. I know whom I have believed. I'm not ashamed. Amen. For I know. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We're not ashamed of the gospel. Which is the good news. Say, it's good news. And we're not ashamed of that good news. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. So you know, 
You believed and you're persuaded. In other words, if you are persuaded, there ain't nobody, there is nothing that's going to change your mind at all because you are so intertwined with the truth of God. You know that you know that you know no matter what. You can't, you can't, you can't change your, no one's going to change your mind. Your mind can't be changed. Your emotions can't be cut off. Oh, thank you, Lord, to the truth of God's saving grace, to the truth of who Jesus is in you, to the truth that your Savior shed his own blood so that we could walk free, to the truth. He is the truth. He is the truth. Not a truth. He's the truth. He's the truth. He's the way, and he's the life. He's our truth. Say, he's my truth. And if other people don't want, they want to reject the truth, the truth, they want to reject the truth for lies, well, you know what? We can pray for them, but we're not going to be them. We're not going to walk in their shoes. We're going to make sure that our lives are truly, literally godly. Godly Christianity is what we're called to walk in. And so when it's difficult, and Paul, he was just talking about the difficulties. He was just, he was just talking about them. But he is saying, you know what? Nevertheless, I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. I believe because I believe I am fully persuaded. I believe. I do believe. And are you fully persuaded? What are you fully, fully persuaded about? Well, he finishes it out with the very last part of this scripture, verse 12. It says that he is able, not that you're able, he is able. Now, our ability is because of Christ's ability within us, because we depend. Say, I depend on the Lord. So therefore, I'm able. I'm able to do what he's called me to do. So he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. He is able to keep. Commit your works to the Lord. Your plans will be established. Commit your works. Commit your day. Commit, your, commit everything unto the Lord. Your ways will be established. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will show you. He already says he, he, he guides you with his eyes, right? Amen. Amen. Watches over us provides for us. Um, I want you to turn to Proverbs 16 because I just, I just um, gave you that scripture or I alluded to it anyways, but Proverbs 16 and 3, it says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Everything you do, every day, commit it to the Lord. Your thoughts will be established. Commit your works unto the Lord and he will bring it to pass. Commit your works, commit your day, commit your children, commit your lives, commit your marriages, commit your children, commit everything, commit your health, commit it, commit it. I commit, I commit. In other words, I gladly and willfully say, Lord, here's my life. You can have it. I want you to have it. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to lead me and guide me. I don't want to be like that horse. I don't want to be like that mule that resists the will of God, that has to be pulled with a bit and bridle. I don't want to be stubborn, and I don't want just any way. I want your way, Amen. the only way. Amen. He's the right way. Amen. He's your savior. Yeah. He's your healer. He's your deliverer. He's the one that speaks to you, counsels you. He watches over you day and night and night and day. It's not just something we sing. It's truth. This is truth. He watches over you. He surrounds you. He surrounds you when you're coming in and you're going out. That's Psalm 121, verses 7 and 8. He surrounds you. He surrounds you both. You're coming in and you're going out. He watches over you. His eye is upon you. Come on. His eyes are upon you. His heart is for you. And he is leading and guiding you through the Holy Spirit of whom we walk with. The paraclete. The one that we get to walk alongside with that he walks alongside us. Never, ever, ever disregard or forget the fact that we have the Holy Spirit. Not any spirit. Not any old spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that we get to walk alongside. He walks alongside us. Let's turn to John 14 and in verse 26. We'll start here. And it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send. Now, Jesus was still on earth at the time. So obviously the Father's already sent. Right? When Jesus went up, he gave us the Holy Spirit. 
but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things, all things, all things, all things. He said all things, didn't he? He says he will teach you. He will teach you. You are not in need or in lack of anything. He says that he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Some of you, I've heard you say it. I can't remember the word of God. I have a hard time. I have a hard time memorizing it or I just have a hard time remembering, you know, when I read, right? But the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to bring these things into your remembrance. Our job is just to stay in the Holy Bible, in the book, the Word of God. Our job is just to be faithful to stay in this. The Holy Spirit will bring things to your remembrance as it is needed, right? So he teaches us all things, and he brings these things back into remembrance as we need them and when we need them, right? Can we trust that our faithful Heavenly Father is so, his eyes are so upon us that he knows our every move? Of course, of course. When we really stop and think about what I'm saying here today, when we really stop and think about this message, how the eyes of the Lord are upon us, our every move, and how he wants us to walk hidden in him, so set apart in him, knowing that the helper, the Holy Spirit, of whom was given unto us, is literally waiting for us to speak forth and to call for help, to talk to him, to walk with him. It's a beautiful promise. And I feel like there are times that we forget. In our flesh, we forget. Now, we're not supposed to walk in the flesh. We're supposed to walk in the spirit, right? Right? But I believe that there are times that we forget about this powerful gift, the spirit of the living God, the third person of the Trinity. He's not an it. He's the person of God. He's the third person of the Trinity. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that walks with us. So, Lord, put us in remembrance when we forget Put us in remembrance when we think, oh, we can't figure it out or we don't know what to do. And then instead we get into the flesh. No, no. This is a perfect opportunity to say, I don't know, but you do, Lord. Put me in remembrance of your word. What does your word say right now? What does your word say about this situation? How can I respond according to your word? Father, put me in remembrance. He said, it's not your job. It's his job to put you in remembrance. It's not your job. It's your job to stay in the word. It's your job to be diligent. Do your due diligence, of course. Read, pray, try, meditate, study, memorize. Be a Berean, of course. But it's he will bring these things to your remembrance. So that should just remove, you know, any weight of, oh, my gosh, i got to remember. How am I going to, how am I going to? No, you're not. You're going to be hidden in Christ. You're going to remember that you walk alongside him. And it is his job to bring things to your remembrance so that you walk right, you pray right, you talk right, right, so that you live right. Because it matters how we live as believers. We will not allow our lives. And I'm speaking for all of you right now. I'm speaking for myself, but I'm, I believe I'm speaking for all. That we're not going to allow our lives to be so sloppy, our Christian lives to be so sloppy that when people see our lives, they go, oh, yeah, they're just one of them. And they lump you into a category that is not true. Some things, okay, charismatic Pentecostal church, some things may look and resemble like someone else. But if they were to really look at your lives, in other words, we believe in healing, miracles, deliverance, people falling down, laughing, laughing. We, we, we're, not, we're not shutting down the Holy Spirit. But we honor the Lord our God in the midst of his own sanctuary. We honor the Lord. In other words, there are some things that are of God and they're right and there are some things that are not. Those things we shut down. So though it may look like you're in certain, you're, you're like certain other companies, when they take a closer look, when they see your lives on a day in and a day out matter, when they see, when they see your lives, they go, you know what? There's a strength within them 
that strength is not their own. That strength is because they have literally depended upon the spirit of the living God. Jesus is their Lord. Jesus is their Savior, the maker. They have chosen the maker, and they will go the way that he instructs, not what we think. We will walk in the way that he instructs us to walk in. He leads us and guides us by his own hand, right? And so we will be people that are, they fear the Lord, a reverential fear of the Lord, in honor of the Lord, respecting the Lord in all of what his word says. And says, Lord, I want what you have. I want it fully. And I will not, I will not walk in a way that brings uh, mixture or, 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 you know, partiality. Amen. Amen. Let's um, say we're still in John 14, but I want you to jump up to verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you, and we want to keep your commandments. The greatest is to love, to be a person that knows how to love one another. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, with everything within you, to love the Lord your God, to love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't have love, you have nothing. You can prophesy, you can do all these things. You don't have love, you're like a sounding gong. Amen. So if you love me, keep my commandments, verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. His promise is to abide with us forever. The Holy Spirit abides with us forever. The Holy Spirit isn't here and there moving around. You are inseparable. He lives within you. You are literally one with him. Now, that doesn't mean he's not grieved. That doesn't mean that when you act in ways that displease him, that he's not grieved and you may not feel the presence of God and you may, you, he may be quiet because of the things that you have done or said or, or been to, right, who you put yourself with, but he doesn't leave you. He's with you. He is forever with you, but we don't want to grieve him. We want to hear his voice. We want to feel the pleasure of God. You go, but that's not about feeling. feelings. It's not about feelings, but God does give us feelings. In other words, we don't walk by our feelings. We don't let our feelings dictate. We let the truth of God's word be what leads us, right? But yet he has given us feelings, and he wants us to, to literally have those feelings in a way that honor God. We get to honor God with our feelings, we have to honor the Lord. Lord, I thank you that, yes, there are so many times we feel the presence of God. We're not going to be ashamed of that simply because the word says we don't go, we don't walk by sight. You know, we, we walk by faith. We're not going to walk by our feelings. No, but feelings are good. We just make sure that they are put in subjection to the Holy Spirit and that it is the Spirit of God that is leading us and not our feelings. He's given them to us, has he not? He's given us emotions. He's given us feelings. So it's our job to make sure that they are under the, the, the obedience of the Lord, we, the, that they're subject to the Spirit of God. And then they're good. Amen. They're good. When I was first saved, I, I remember, and it pro it's probably just the way I heard it. I probably misunderstood. But what I, how I understood it to be was is that feelings were bad. You know, and that you can't go by your feelings. You can't go by your emotions. They're bad. They're bad. They're bad. You know? And it's like, so I was like, you know, got to kill the feelings. Got to kill the emotions. But that's impossible. You know, like you have them. They're God-given. You know? And so, but then it becomes the process of learning how to, how to, how to make sure that they're, they're in submission to the will of God. And how you make sure that you walk by the Spirit and not by your emotions. But your emotions are not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, it could be if you're full of anger, and that's a whole other message, right? I'm not talking about those kinds of emotions. I'm talking about we get to delight ourselves in the Lord. He wants you to delight yourself in Him, and He delights in you. How are you going to delight yourself in the Lord if you're not going to allow your feelings to feel? He's with you. If He's with you... He's a God of all compassion. He's with you. He's a God of all compassion. Do you think there's a little bit of feelings in that? Compassion? Compassion? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's a good God, church. And he says, I want you to feel my delight. I want you to experience my delight. Yes, I want you to know my word, and yes, I want you to walk disciplined in the spirit, but I want you to know that I am the God who gives you more than you can ever dream, hope, or imagine. I'm, I'm the type of God that says, I want to give you more than you're even asking today. 
I'm with you, and I'm not leaving you. I'm not, I'm not separating myself from you. Oh, I'll teach you. I will instruct you in the way that you should go. I will watch over you with my eye. Absolutely. But I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to. He doesn't disappoint us, and he doesn't, he doesn't leave us. So we get to keep our eyes on the Lord. We get to keep our lives committed to him. And we get to remember. It is God who's going to put us in remembrance. It's the spirit of the living God that puts us in remembrance of the things we need to know. And if we lack wisdom, we ask. And he gives to all abundantly. 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 